In this lecture, we're going to talk about plot in poetry using Robert Browning's My Last Duchess as an example. If you haven't already listened to the audio resource uh, reading of My Last Duchess that's provided, I would recommend you do so. It does help to hear this poem read aloud. My Last Duchess has a more fully formed plot than some poems that you see, so it's a good one to use as an example. The first thing to notice about this poem is that it actually has a frame narrative. Sometimes people call that a story within a story. Um, basically, it's a structure where you have an outer frame, and that's the first uh, approximately 10 to 12 lines of the poem, and then it returns to that frame at the end um, when, it, when there's that turn, um, I repeat, the count your master's known munificence. And we'll, we'll get to that in a second. But let's just, let's talk about the, the plot that we find in the frame narrative. So what's happening here is the Duke, who is the speaker of the poem, is addressing someone. We don't know who that interlocutor is, who that audience is, not at the outset, but they're in his, you know, kind of art gallery and they're looking at a specific painting. And apparently the person that he's talking to has asked him why the woman in the painting has that look on her face. And we understand that from poem, from lines approximately 11, 12 here, um, th that you're not the first one, he says, who has turned and seemed as if they would ask if they dared how such a glance came there. So there, you know, he's looking at the face of the woman. And he's, re he's actually reading in the face of the person he's talking to that he has a question about how, how you know, why she has this look on her face. And, you know, it's, it's a look of joy and happiness. Then we find that out as, as, the um, narrative continues here. So, so that's the initial state of affairs. That's our opening frame. And that's also, that would also map onto the exposition if we're talking about our technical units of plot. That's the state of affairs we have at the beginning of the story. He gets into the answer to that question. That, that, and that question we can think of as the inciting incident. As we get into the answer to that question, um, that's where we get a turn in meaning as well. Uh, and, and we start, start into the inner frame, which is the Duke's memories of his wife, and he begins to describe her. And that is sort of this rising action, and it's this uh, layered description that he talks about the things that made her happy. And there were lots of things that made her happy. And we begin to note in the way that the Duke relates those things that it kind of bugs him that so many things made her happy. Uh, we get that, for example, around line 22. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. And we get an even more sinister implication about his wife in the rest of that line in the next one. She liked whatever she looked on and her looks went everywhere. So that is a, is a clue, like I said, a sort of implication. What you can infer from that is that perhaps the Duke thinks that his wife was cheating on him or at least interacting with men in a way that uh, wasn't exactly okay for a married woman. Now we don't, you know, remember, we're only getting the Duke's point of view on this, but that's definitely the implication that's embedded in that, in that line. As we read on, we also note that he's getting uh, in his, in the way that he's describing her and describing how he thinks about her actions, that he's getting increasingly upset about this, right? When, when we get to the point where he says, you know, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift, clearly he's getting a bit upset, right? Um, and all of this description uh, of her behavior is piling up till we get to the point where you know, what do you do about that? And that's really the climax of, of this, this story, right? This grew, I gave commands, then all smiles stopped together. And then this is where we break out of the inner um, story and go back to the outer frame. There she stands, this is as if alive. So it's in what isn't said that we get the climax, really, the biggest plot point here. And that is that the Duke had his wife killed, killed her or had his wife killed. Obviously it's not clear, but he does say, I gave commands. Then all smiles stopped together. Now, why do I say that he killed her? Because it's juxtaposed, put right next to, there she stands as if alive. So by putting those two ideas that he gave commands and her smiles stopped, 
right next to saying, there she stands as if alive. He's communicating pretty clearly to the reader and to the audience in, in the uh, world of the poem that he had her killed. That obviously raises some other questions. Why would you just be admitting that? And why on earth would you tell it to this particular person? And those are actually pretty important parts of the plot as well. So like I said, that's that turning point where we're going back to the outer frame. And this, this is a, a bit of a tricky part because it's um, culturally distant from us. So we need to understand a little bit of cultural context to really understand what's going on at the end of this poem and to decode who the, the um, Duke has been talking to all this time. And we do find out. So uh, in these lines here, um, we'll please you to rise, we'll meet the company below. I repeat, the count your master's known munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. And the, the word dowry, that's the big clue that lets us know what's happening. So who has he been talking to all this time? He's been talking to the representative of the family of another girl, another, you know, wealthy, aristocratic girl, right? The, her father is a count who he wants to marry. So he's in the middle of, of marriage negotiations. When you're talking dowry, this is when aristocratic people, uh, when, when they would make alliances, marriage alliances, you know, back in earlier centuries, they would meet first and the males in the family would meet first and they would basically negotiate the financial terms. So how much money um, comes along with your daughter and then what am I promising to do uh, for her? So they would have these, and they would be written contracts, honestly. Um, and so it's this negotiation between male family members that's going on right now for him basically negotiating for a new wife. So he is telling this story about his past wife to the representative of the family of the prospective new wife. And the story that he tells is all about the things that bugged him in his first wife. And, the, and his response to that, which was killing her. So that's the story he's telling to the family of the prospective new wife. And while that's pretty amazing to us, it also tells us some things uh, about this period, what's going on in this time, that he feels so secure and confident, he really can tell that story as a warning. And they're not going to run away screaming. You know, someone's probably going to whisper in the ear of this girl, hey, and by the way, don't smile at anybody but your husband, right? Because that's clearly the, the message of this story. So that's the outer frame. And then it goes even even to a more um, general place where he's talking about, you know, the Neptune taming the seahorse. He's basically just pointing out another piece of art in his gallery, you know, kind of, sh you know, shifting the conversation away from this sort of darker thing that he was saying about his, about his first wife. Just to finish identifying the different parts of the plot here, the climax is clearly that moment where we're moving from the end of the inner story back to the outer frame where we, get, we realize, again, through implication, not said straight out, but we realize that he had his wife killed. So that's clearly the climax there. Then the falling action is the revelation that, you know, he's talking to this representative of the next, um, the family of the next person that he wants to marry. And then, of course, the conclusion is um, that they're going back down to talk to the count and finish off those negotiations, those dowry negotiations. So. We can see here that we have a, a pretty complex plot. It has all those pieces that we talked about. Um, and it also has that frame narrative that makes it even, even a little more complex. And if we think about his, you know, his memories, it's really giving a lot of backstory um, as another feature. That's basically the backstory is the inner narrative in the frame. So it's not a very long poem, but it is a pretty complex one in terms of the plot.